The Doors of Perception by Aldous Huxley It was in 1886 that German pharmacologist Louis Lewin published the first systematic study of the cactus, to which his own name was subsequently given. And Halonium Lewini was new to science. To primitive religion and the Indians of Mexico and the American Southwest, it was a friend of immemorially long standing. Indeed, it was much more than a friend. In the words of one of the early Spanish visitors to the New World, quote, they eat a root which they call peyote and which they venerate as though it were a deity, end quote. Why they should have venerated it as a deity became apparent when such eminent psychologists as Jensch, Havelock Ellis, and Weir Mitchell began their experiments with mescaline, the active principle of peyote. True, they stopped short at a point well this side of idolatry, but all concurred in assigning to mescaline a position among drugs of unique distinction. Administered in suitable doses, it changes the quality of consciousness more profoundly, and yet is less toxic than any other substance in the pharmacologist's repertory. Mescaline research has been going on sporadically ever since the days of Lewin and Havelock Lewis. Chemists have not merely isolated the alkaloid, they have learned how to synthesize it, so that the supply no longer depends on the sparse and intermittent crop of a desert cactus. Alienists have dosed themselves with mescaline in the hope thereby of coming to a better, a first-hand understanding of their patients' mental processes. Working, unfortunately, upon too few subjects within too narrow a range of circumstances, psychologists have observed and catalogued some of the drug's more striking effects. Neurologists and physiologists have found out something about the mechanism of its action upon the central nervous system, and at least one professional philosopher has taken mescaline for the light it may throw on such ancient, unsolved riddles as the place of mind in nature and the relationship between brain and consciousness. There, matters rested, until two or three years ago, a new and perhaps highly significant fact was observed. Actually, the fact had been staring everyone in the face for several decades, but nobody, as it happened, had noticed it, until a young English psychiatrist at present working in Canada was struck by the close similarity in chemical composition between mescaline and adrenaline. Further research revealed that lysergic acid, an extremely potent hallucinogen derived from ergot, has a structural biochemical relationship to the others. Then came the discovery that adrenochrome, which is a product of the decomposition of adrenaline, can produce many of the symptoms observed in mescaline intoxication. But adrenochrome probably occurs spontaneously in the human body. In other words, each one of us may be capable of manufacturing a chemical minute doses of which are known to cause profound changes in consciousness. Certain of these changes are similar to those which occur in that most characteristic plague of the 20th century, schizophrenia. Is the mental disorder due to a chemical disorder? And is the chemical disorder due, in its turn, to psychological distresses affecting the adrenals? It would be rash and premature to affirm it. The most we can say is that some kind of prima facie case has been made out. Meanwhile, the clue is being systematically followed. The sleuths, biochemists, psychiatrists, psychologists, are on the trail. By a series of, for me, extremely fortunate circumstances, I found myself in the spring of 1953 squarely athwart that trail. One of the sleuths had come on business to California. In spite of 70 years of mescaline research, the psychological material at his disposal was still absurdly inadequate, and he was anxious to add to it. I was on the spot, and willing, indeed eager, to be a guinea pig. Thus, it came about that, one bright May morning, I swallowed four-tenths of a gram of mescaline, dissolved in half a glass of water, and sat down to wait for the results. We lived together, 
we act on and react to one another, but always and in all circumstances we are by ourselves. The martyrs go hand in hand into the arena. They are crucified alone. Embraced, the lovers desperately try to fuse their insulated ecstasies into a single self-transcendence. In vain. By its very nature, every embodied spirit is doomed to suffer and enjoy in solitude. Sensations, feelings, insights, fancies, all these are private and, except through symbols and at second hand, incommunicable. We can pool information about experiences, but never the experiences themselves. From family to nation, every human group is a society of island universes. Most island universes are sufficiently like one another to permit of inferential understanding, or even of mutual empathy or feeling into, thus remembering our own bereavements and humiliations. We can condole with others in analogous circumstances, can put ourselves, always of course, in a slightly Pickwickian sense, in their places. But in certain cases, communication between universes is incomplete, or even non-existent. The mind is its own place, and the places inhabited by the insane and the exceptionally gifted are so different from the places where ordinary men and women live that there is little or no common ground of memory to serve as a basis for understanding or fellow feeling. Words are uttered, but fail to enlighten. The things and events to which the symbols refer belong to mutually exclusive realms of experience. To see ourselves as others see us is a most salutary gift. Hardly less important is the capacity to see others as they see themselves. But what if these others belong to a different species and inhabit a radically alien universe? For example, how can the sane get to know what it actually feels like to be mad? Or, short of being born again as a visionary, a medium, or a musical genius, how can we ever visit the worlds which to Blake, to Swedenborg, to Johann Sebastian Bach were home? And how can a man at the extreme limits of ectomorphy and cerebrotonia ever place himself in the place of one at the limits of endomorphy and viscerotonia? or except within certain circumscribed areas, share the feelings of one who stands at the limits of mesomorphy and somatotonia. To the unmitigated behaviorist, such questions, I suppose, are meaningless. But for those who theoretically believe what in practice they know to be true, namely, that there is an inside to experience as well as an outside, the problems posed are real problems all the more grave for being some completely insoluble, some soluble only in exceptional circumstances and by methods not available to everyone. Thus, it seems virtually certain that I shall never know what it feels like to be Sir John Falstaff or Joe Lewis. On the other hand, it had always seemed to me possible that through hypnosis, for example, or auto-hypnosis by means of systematic meditation or else by taking the appropriate drug, I might so change my ordinary mode of consciousness as to be able to know from the inside what the visionary, the medium, even the mystic were talking about. From what I had read of the mescaline experience, I was convinced in advance that the drug would admit me at least for a few hours into the kind of inner world described by Blake and A.E. But what I had expected did not happen. I had expected to lie with my eyes shut, looking at visions of many-colored geometries, of animated architectures rich with gems and fabulously lovely, of landscapes with heroic figures, of symbolic dramas trembling perpetually on the verge of the ultimate revelation but I had not reckoned it was evident. With the idiosyncrasies of my mental makeup, the facts of my temperament, training, and habits, 
I am, and for as long as I can remember, I have always been a poor visualizer. Words, even the pregnant words of poets, do not evoke pictures in my mind. No hypnagogic visions greet me on the verge of sleep. When I recall something, the memory does not present itself to me as a vividly seen event or object. By an effort of the will, I can evoke a not very vivid image of what happened yesterday afternoon, of how the Lugarno used to look before the bridges were destroyed, of the Bayswater Road, when the only buses were green and tiny and drawn by aged horses at three and a half miles an hour. But such images have little substance and absolutely no autonomous life of their own. They stand to real perceived objects in the same relation as Homer's ghosts stood to the men of flesh and blood who came to visit them in the shades. Only when I have a high temperature do my mental images come to independent life. To those in whom the faculty of visualization is strong, my inner world must seem curiously drab, limited, and uninteresting. This was the world, a poor thing but my own, which I expected to see transformed into something completely unlike itself. The change which actually took place in that world was in no sense revolutionary. Half an hour after swallowing the drug, I became aware of a slow dance of golden lights. A little later, there were sumptuous red surfaces swelling and expanding from bright nodes of energy that vibrated with a continuously changing patterned life. At another time, the closing of my eyes revealed a complex of gray structures within which pale bluish spheres kept emerging into intense solidity and having emerged would slide noiselessly upwards out of sight. But at no time were there faces or forms of men or animals. I saw no landscapes, no enormous spaces, no magical growth and metamorphosis of buildings, nothing remotely like a drama or a parable. The other world to which Mescaline admitted me was not the world of visions. It existed out there, in what I could see with my eyes open. The great change was in the realm of objective fact. What happened to my subjective universe was relatively unimportant. I took my pill at eleven. An hour and a half later, I was sitting in my study, looking intently at a small glass vase. The vase contained only three flowers, a full-blown belly of Portugal rose, shell pink with a hint at every petal's base of a hotter, flamier hue, a large magenta and cream-colored carnation, and, pale purple at the end of its broken stalk, the bold heraldic blossom of an iris. Fortuitous and provisional, the little nosegay broke all the rules of traditional good taste. At breakfast that morning, I had been struck by the lively dissonance of its colors. But that was no longer the point. I was not looking now at an unusual flower arrangement. I was seeing what Adam had seen on the morning of his creation. The miracle, moment by moment, of naked existence. Is it agreeable? Somebody asked. During this part of the experiment, all conversations were recorded on a dictating machine, and it has been possible for me to refresh my memory of what was said. Neither agreeable nor disagreeable, I answered. It just is.